This is what's known as the Svalbard Stroll. It's a brisk, hands in pockets type of affair. Because you're at the end of the earth, and it's really freaking cold. So this is the first time you've ever seen this place? I've never been here before. No, I never even thought I would ever be in Svalbard. <laughs> <laughs> My Arctic companion is Nat Friedman, CEO of the software platform GitHub. Right. He usually lives in San Francisco, but he's traveled to the ends of the earth to do something peculiar. So we're here in Svalbard at 78 degrees north latitude at the site of the future GitHub Arctic Code Vault. He's depositing 6,000 of the most popular open source projects in an archive inside this mountain. Open the vault! <laughs> Nat's goal here is one, to protect the world's software from the apocalypse, and two, preserve our modern way of life. The man is ambitious. How much of this is an existential risk type thing? Most of the time when you build a product, you build it hoping that lots of people use it all the time. And uh, this is probably a case where we're building a product kind of hoping that it never gets used yeah. in a way. Fingers crossed, Matt. Fingers crossed. For those of you who haven't wintered in Svalbard, it's located way up here. A frigid, barren wasteland, void of trees or any meaningful vegetation. The last spot humans can tolerate before the Arctic proves too much. Getting here requires much planning and deep resolve to face Mother Nature at her worst. Or, you know, a private jet and the courage gained by downing bubbly by the gallon and embracing your inner playboy. Hello, Svalbard. Coal mining used to be the main game at Svalbard, but since that's not cool anymore, people here have had to find some other uses for all their permafrost. Which brings us back to our coal mine and our code cave. Is this what you expected the entrance to your seed vault to look like? It legitimately looks like the entrance to a mine. <laughs> so I believe we are going deep inside a mountain. This is an old coal mine. Nat and I were joined by some proper mine men who taught us the ways of the mine. So we have some instruments. Okay. Oh, to check the methane. And who were also helpful in firming up the concept of existential risk. You produce coal, they will come a little bit gas. You don't uh, feel it? You die. But you have hypoxia. <laughs> you yeah, die. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> With the safety brief down, yeah. it's time to get on to the real business of protecting the world's code. You see the light, you see the documents. This is how it works. The data is stored on a reel of film coated with iron oxide powder. The information can still be read by a computer, or if need be, okay. by a human with a magnifying glass. How long will this last? We're confident uh, for a thousand, and we're aiming now to do a research project to document 2,000 years. Okay. 2,000 years. Two thousand years? You think this could last up to 2,000 yes. years? We, think so. we collected the film, which is spooled inside these white plastic cases, and headed into the darkness. I mean, <laughs> usually, I'm, a coal mine. yeah, like usually I have the hard hats and I feel like it's for show. <laughs> yeah, this is not it's for not. show. As we venture further into the abyss, let me catch you up on who Nat is. Nat's company, GitHub, is the main place people go to write open source code. Tens of millions of people hop on GitHub and create the applications that make the world tick, which is why Nat wants to protect it from terrorist hackers, electromagnetic pulses, and other unforeseen disasters. Where are we going? And where we were going was not good. Okay, let's get the hell out. But like all intrepid explorers, we would not let something like a lack of oxygen stop us. And thank God for that. Because I now present to you the most futuristic, ultra secure, sci-fi inspired code vault you will ever see. Okay, it's basically a tool shed, but it's still cool. Wow. Into the data vaults. <laughs> I mean, this is real one of the GitHub Arctic code vault, and we're gonna put it here 
in Svalbard under the ice for the next 2,000 years. You are welcome. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> like I think 20 years ago, if you told someone that you know, 20 years in the future, in the year 2020, all of human civilization will depend on and run on open source code written for free and put into almost every product in the world, I think people would say like, that's crazy. Like that's never gonna happen. <laughs> like the you know, software is written by big professional companies and, uh, and yet here we are. And, yeah. and so how much of this is just making sure we could restore our way of life? I'm overall pretty optimistic about civilization. Like I think we can bet that, you know, humans will be thriving for a long time on planet Earth. And so another way to think about this is it's just like a time capsule. Like there's this amazing moment in history where the whole world is starting to run on software. And that software is made out of open source. You know, open source is sort of in everything. 20 years ago, open source software was seen as a fringe idea. The big companies kept their code secret. Only weird hippie types shared code and gave it away for free. Fast forward to 2019, and about 40 million people and 2 million companies and organizations use GitHub. That's why Microsoft paid a stunning $7.5 billion to acquire the company last year. I'll just leave it like this. Safe in the knowledge that open source code will be secure, it was time for me to explore Svalbard. Nat and I returned to our nerd pursuits. This time we were checking out the northernmost GitHub users, who work at an observatory dedicated to researching the northern lights. It was lunchtime, and we needed to get there quick before it got dark. 1.20 p.m., sun is setting. It never really rose, actually. We didn't see it all day. Here, in this observatory, perched on a snowy mountain, work some seriously hardy scientists. So during the daytime for three and a half months over the winter, it is completely dark. And so we can make 24 hour observations um, of the aurora. And why would somebody want to study the aurora? The aurora is important for understanding the whole process of the connection between the sun and the Earth's magnetic field and then the ultimate impact on the atmosphere. So this is what we call space weather. This Arctic island is full of surprises. I have to do a photo, man, this is crazy. There are a lot of white mountains, some more white mountains, and these white mountains, which host one of the world's biggest satellite ground stations. Our modern infrastructure relies on the messages sent from here. But if you need a break from nerding out, the real action takes place in the town of Longyearbyen, which was clearly named after a very lonely coal miner who'd had enough. As dumb luck would have it, I was in town during the island's blues festival, an annual event that brings in serious musicians and serves as one last drunken hurrah before months of darkness set in. I mean, it's not so much the alcohol as the cold that's... Uh... And so I got drunk... Yeah, you're my sir. ...and hurrah. Then I got a truly horrible hangover. Had a rough night at the Blues Festival. Today, I will feel better by going dog sledding. And the, uh, you got the gun for the uh, polar bear situation? Polar bear protection, yeah, because yeah. we have dogs with us, so there's a better protection probably than the gun. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, cool. Not quite the private jet, but it's my preferred way for getting around Svalbard. As the trip neared its end, we went to Svalbard's bizarrely amazing fine dining establishment to celebrate. Fried cod skin filled with the Norwegian king crab. Things were going fine for a while. Fancy food, fancy booze, and then the theme of our journey got very real. <laughs> Holy shit. Wow. That's so crazy. It turns out that about 4,000 miles away in Sonoma, California, Nat's house had been destroyed by the fires raging through the state. It's super apropos of what we're doing right now, right? So wait, like somebody posted that on Twitter? He had the gross modern experience of seeing the remains of his house end up on social media. Oh my gosh, that's super so devastating. So there we were with parts of California burning and Silicon Valley going through rolling blackouts. 
the epicenter of technology feeling very fragile amid signs that the world is not quite right. In that moment, the idea of a remote code cave made all too much sense.